so more Tumur questions uh, from Jacqueline Tyler on algebra and functions. Uh, Jacqueline is a tutor. Um, I've, I've put her email address uh, down below and, uh, and she's written plenty of these papers. So I'm just trying to do my best to work through them all. Um, we're going to start with question one, obviously. The key thing here, of course, is to make all the bases the same. The problem is, is that they don't, they're not all nice powers of, of just two or three. They're kind of mixed together. But that's okay, because we just kind of prime factorization them all and then distribute the powers to each of their primes. So the 36 is two squared times three squared. You can do a prime factor three if you really, really want to. And then you distribute that P minus Q to both of those individually. The same kind of thing is going on in the bottom. And now we can kind of collect all the threes up on the top and the twos and the threes on the bottom, just adding lots of powers here, because of course that's all we have to do when we're multiplying things, just adding lots of powers. And then finally we can take away the powers of two and take away the powers of three. And in the end, the Qs, um, sorry, not the Qs, yeah, sorry, the Qs, the Qs all end up going away. And so um, this doesn't depend on Q at all. This is going to be an integer as long as P is negative, because if P is negative, this makes this power a positive integer, um, assuming that P is, of course, also an integer, which it is. Um, and therefore, we'll have a positive power of two and likewise over here for the threes. So we just need P to be negative and we'll be done. Quite a similar question here. We'll break 56 down into prime factors or even just a seven and eight actually because we already have an eight here. So we're trying to get it to look a bit like this. Distribute the 56 to both. And then of course, um, we can write this 56 again, maybe as also seven times eight, but different ways around each time. The first time in order to make sure we can get this M in here and the second time in order to make sure we can get the N in. Uh, and then we end up with, with just this, which of course is just that. Another nice question. Got a couple of questions like this to do. This is the easier one to do, of course. It's just a quadratic that has roots of minus two and four. So it looks a bit like this. It's positive when you're to the left of minus two or to the right of four. So we'll just put that down pretty easily. And then this one here, we just need to be careful. We can't times both sides by x minus one. Because if we do that, um, we might be flipping this inequality if x minus one is negative. So you could do this case by case, but the way that I'm just going to do this, because it's good practice, is to times both sides by x minus 1 squared. If I times by x minus 1 squared, then I cannot be timesing by a negative number, and so therefore this inequality definitely holds. Um, so okay, well one of them on the left will cancel, which is just leave one left over. Let's expand all this out, uh, rearrange of course, and we can just factorize that. Uh, roots at minus 4 and plus 1. We're going to be less than, uh, we're going to be in between the roots, right, because we're less than 0. So it's this, and then we need to combine these things together. When are both true? Well, it's only when x is between minus 2 and minus 4, I think. And so our answer to this one will be e. Very similar here. Cannot times by x. Cannot times by x plus 3. But I am allowed to times by x squared and x plus 3 or squared. So it's it ends up making a um, bit of an annoying, unwieldy equation. But it does at least make the inequality hold, which is all that really matters when it comes down to it. An x is everywhere in here, so I can factorize that and just leave a cubic. And now I think I just need to use a bit of factor theorem to try and solve this cubic. Um, so, you know, test some small numbers. Um, and also you have massive hints because it's a multiple choice test. Test these numbers you see in front of you, right? Those are the only things you really, five isn't worth testing because you can't make a 36 out of five. But the two and the three and the six, those are all worth testing with some minuses. And eventually after you write the whole thing out again, completely pointlessly, you'll find that minus two is indeed a factor. Minus two cubed is minus eight. Uh, then you'll end up minusing another four. Then you'll add in, you know, two times 24 and then take away 36 ends up being zero. And then not only can we take out the minus two or the X plus two, I should say, um, we can then factorize the remaining bit because of course X times X squared must make X cubed and two times minus 18 makes minus 36. All I'm missing is the middle term, which I can just use either the X squared or the minus 24 for. But because I've already got maybe two X squared here, I need a minus three X squared to make a minus X squared in total. So that's that, and then we factorize it again. Roots at zero, minus two, six, and minus three. Um, and uh, that's gonna work, because it's a positive quartic, of course, this is what the graph looks like, and we're going to be um, great, sorry, less than zero in between all the roots, in between minus three and minus two, and in between zero and six, which I think is one of our conditions there. Bear in mind also, if you want, didn't want to do any of this maths, if, this, if a question did like this did come up, you could just test all of these ranges, you know, very carefully, and just find the one that's always true if you just wanted to avoid doing any real maths other than substitution. Um, so yeah, that is a totally a valid method you could have done here. For the next one, again, we are going to times by x squared and times by x plus 4p all squared. It's going to again make a quartic, I think. 
Um, but again, that Quartic has an X everywhere, so we can factor that out. And, uh, and then we can deal with this guy in here. We've got some nice symmetrical coefficients in here, which gives away. And of course, you've also got hints, just like in the previous question, as to what factor of this cubic you might want to use, be it 2p or 4p. Um, it turns out that 2p works pretty nicely. It's the first thing I tested was just positive 2p. Um, and it works pretty well. And then again, x times x squared is x cubed. Minus 2p times plus 8p squared is minus 16p squared cubed. And then to make 4px squared, we've currently got minus 2px squared. So I think you need a plus 6px squared to end up with this. And then we could also check the x's if we wanted to, but I can't be bothered. This also factorizes to just x plus 4x plus 2p, uh, like so. And, uh, and so we've got roots at 0, 2p, minus 4p, and minus 2p. We'll draw the graph just like we did before. And uh, we're looking to be less than 0 again. So it's in between minus 4p and minus 2p and 0 and 2p. And that will be our answer for that one as well. Question 6, much uh, nicer question here. Not too much work to do. Uh, two distinct roots, of course, means that uh, we want, uh, well, and I was about to say we want the discriminant to be um, positive, but it's a cubic. I've just seen it's a cubic. So what do we actually need? Well, what we can do um, is two distinct real roots means one of them is repeated and one of them isn't repeated. So what this means is that this cubic factorizes to be like x minus a times by x minus b all squared, or the other way around, um, like this. And now we can just expand that right hand side out, uh, which eventually makes this. I think I probably collected some terms up. No, I didn't. I just expanded out. And then I said, well, okay, well, this stuff here, because this is a factorization of this thing, it just must be the same. So the x cubed, cubed match, which of course they have to. But of course, over here I have zero x squared. And over here I have minus 2a minus b x squared. So that needs to equal zero in order for these sides to match and for this to be the correct factorization of this. And likewise, we've got kx's over here. And we've got a squared plus 2abx's over there, so that must equal k. Um, and then the last bit is minus ab squared must equal minus 2, of course. Um, in the end, I didn't use the x term because I guess I didn't need it because I'm only looking for two things, so I only need two equations. And I guess these were the two that I wanted to use. That's fine. Times this one by minus 1. Um, rearrange for b, I guess. Put the b in there. Times everything by a squared. And uh, this ends up being uh, quite easy from here. a equals minus 1, I guess. Divide, yeah, sure, that sounds all right. And then, of course, b equals 2 from here. And we end up with uh, what value of k? Oh, yeah, of course, I can't use the x's because that would give me a k, which is pointless. I need to solve for k. So now I can use the x's. I remember this question now. It's been a couple of days. Now I can use the x's um, to say, well, um, a squared plus 2ab equals k. And then we can just throw those results in there and we'll end up with k equals minus 3 for our answer. Question seven then, so this is just a quadratic with uh, two distinct real roots, so b squared minus 4c greater than zero, I guess. One root is four more than the other root. Now there's tons of ways you can do this, um, but the way that I, I think I've done questions like this in the past is just say, well, there's the quadratic formula. One root is using the plus and one root is using the minus. So why don't we just take those as our two roots? The difference between them is four. So just take the first one, take away the other one and just say that equals four. That should do it. Um, and now we can just substitute in a, b, and c. a is 2, b is 9, c is minus k. So we end up with this times everything by 4 and expand out essentially this implicit bracket here to make this a plus. Cancel out the 9s because the minus minus goes away. You get 2 lots of the third, divide by 2, square both sides. And uh, it should be able to see pretty easily here that k is going to be minus that. It's not going to be too hard to work out from there. Question 8 then, the minimum value of this. I, I don't think I've gone about this the right way, but it doesn't really matter. 4 is 2 squared, um, and now we're going to do that super nice trick where we swap the powers over because it ends up being really helpful. We can now write this as a quadratic in the power of the uh, a quadratic centered around 2 to the power of sine x, which you could make a substitution for, but I, I can't be bothered. I'm just going to factorize that minus and just have in my head that this is like u squared and this is like minus 2u here. So now I can just complete the square, um, halve the 1 down to a, sorry, half the 2 down to a 1, square on the outside, take away 1 squared. Combine it with this, and we end up with this. Distribute the minus back out again, and we end up with that. And now I'm being asked for the minimum value of this. So it's tempting to say, well, of course, this is positive, which means with the negative, it's actually negative. Well, I can just do whatever I want. I can make it massively negative, right? But you can't because, of course, 2 to the power of sine of x minus 1 is capped. Um, we can say that if sine of x equals 1, we get 2 to the 1 minus 1 is 1. Squared is 1, and it's minus 1 plus this thing, um, which is just this. And then you could test the other end if you use 2 to the minus 1, because that's the other end of sine. 2 to the minus 1 gives you a half, 
um, and then a half minus one is a is minus a half squared is a quarter but you wouldn't be taking away as much you'd be taking away only a quarter so this is the best we can do to bring this function as low as possible and so therefore the answer is definitely going to be 10 thirds i think uh, question nine um, when this is multiplied by this and the resulting product is divided by that the range is it. now this is going to leverage something called a the remainder theorem which is a super useful theorem to know uh, basically, you all know factor theorem. If x minus a divides f of x and f of a is zero, you can also write that the other way around, but I'm just writing this around for a second. Um, you can rewrite this to be clear about what you mean by divides. What we mean by divides, because we can divide anything by anything, right? But what we mean by divides is it divides it with remainder zero. So if x minus a divides f of x with remainder zero, then f of a equals zero. That's a better wording of factor theorem. But actually, remainder theorem, factor theorem is just a special case of something called a remainder theorem. And remainder theorem says you can basically substitute this number for whatever you want. So if x minus a divides f of x with remainder 28, then that means f of a is 28. Factor theorem is just a special case where the remainder happens to be zero. So what this means is when we multiply these two things out, and by the way, I couldn't be bothered to multiply those two things out because I'm lazy. And then we divide by x plus one, the remainder is 28. That means that when we divide this by x minus one, sorry, x plus one, that means f of minus 1, swapping this over, f of minus 1 equals 28, right? This divides this for the remainder 28, so therefore f of minus 1 is 28. So the function here, this is the function, didn't bother expanding it, the function at minus 1 equals 28. So just put in minus 1 into all of these x's, you get this, that must equal 28. There's a minus here, I can swap it with the 28 over there to make this, evaluate that, divide by minus 7, and therefore p is 3. Really nice question. Question 10, we have two distinct solutions to this. So that of course means we're going to rearrange this one for y, shove the result into there and solve this for x and we want b squared minus 4ac to be greater than 0. So not a particularly complicated question this one. I'm going to shove this in here, expand out and collect together some terms which I've already done. Um, we want b squared minus 4ac to be greater than 0. b is p and, and then a is 1 and c is minus 4. So we get this. But the thing is, this is something squared so it's 0 or bigger and this is plus 16. So this is always positive. So P can take any value we want because this thing here is just always a positive number. Um, as soon as we see moduluses, we should be thinking about drawing things. I've talked about this in videos in the past. Uh, mod X just looks like a V shape and then we're gonna shift it down by three. So it's gonna look like this. Um, this one here is gonna have its cusp at minus six. You just need to solve the inside of the modulus um, to get to minus six as your cusp to make it to equal to zero. So it's gonna have a cusp at minus six and it's gonna be a bit steeper than the other one because it's a two X hit. So it looks a bit like this. And we can see here that we're only gonna get two solutions to this. We're gonna get one here and one off the screen somewhere because this one is steeper than this one. It's gonna catch up to it. So one solution there, one solution there. All we have to do is write down the equations of each of the actual lines here. So for example, this equation is minus X minus three because this modulus is behaving as a negative over in the negative space. Uh, this equation here is just the positive version of this, that's 2x plus 12. And this version here is the negative version of it, so it's minus 2x minus 12. And now we just need to set this one equal to this one to find this x-intercept, which is fairly easy to do. Uh, minus 5, do a quick logic check, does that make sense? Yes, it does, because that cusp we said was at minus 6, so that's good. And then set this one equal to this one to find the intercept way off the screen there. And we get minus 9, also makes sense, add them up, you get minus 14 for our answer. I'm going to draw this one again x cubed modded is just going to be x cubed over here um so it's going to just be kind of this thing and then on the other side it used to be this thing but it's modded so it's going to be positive so it's going to be this thing here so it ends up just looking like a quadratic which is nice and now mod x we already discussed is a v-shape mod x minus one is a v-shape shifted one to the right so it's going to look like look like this um same gradients on the lines and then we can just piecewise add these functions up to see what this whole function looks like so for example, at the x, uh, on the y-axis, it's zero plus one to give you a height of one. Um, and then as we travel up along here to here, of course, this is also height one because it's just one plus zero the other way over. But of course, because this function is falling at the same rate this function is rising, we're just gonna end up with a straight line going across because whatever, when we add these two lines together, one is decreasing at the same rate the other way is increasing, we're just gonna get the same number when we add them up over and over. And then of course, they're both increasing over here so we're just going to end up with an increasing line and they're both increasing over here. So when we add, the, uh, add them up, we're just going to end up with an increasing line. Remove the extra stuff and it looks like this and we have one and two intercepts. So the answer is two. 
Good question, this one. You just need to be brave enough to expand this out because the middle terms go away because of the plus minus and the symmetry that's in here. Times everything by a cubed b cubed. You can make a substitution here if you want. I chose to do that to make this. Um, and now we can um, just solve this. You can complete the square if you want to, or you can use formula. It's kind of, kind of completely up to you. Root 12 is 2 root 3, so I was able to do that quite quickly. 3 plus 2 root 3 is 3 root 3, and then minus is minus root 3. And now we still need to say, firstly, um, how do we discount one of these two solutions? Um, we don't allow 3 root 3 because I literally can't remember why I discounted 3 root 3. Why did I discount 3 root 3 here? Did I actually discount it? Is it because uh, desperately, I, why, why is that not an answer to this question? I can't for the life of me remember. Um, oh, of course, we're being asked for the least value. So AB, which is the cube root of this, can take two different values apparently. We're being asked for the smallest one. So we just take the smallest one. It's great, not hard. Anyway, now we're gonna cube root. This is to the power of half, of course. So when we cube root, that's to the power of a third, and then we multiply the powers together, and we end up with the power of a sixth. So the answer will be E to this question. 14 then, uh, really lovely questions to finish this up. Um, we've got F of, we're asked for F of one, so the obvious thing to do is just shove X equals one in here. Now that's gonna give you a minus one here, so maybe the next obvious thing is to think, well, if I just shoved minus one in here, I would get another one out of that, minus minus one. And then I'd end up with a simultaneous equation, which is totally what you end up doing. So I'm gonna swap those two over to be this. And then you just need to imagine these as X's and these as Y's, and it's just a simultaneous equation, right? Times this one by three, maybe, times this one by two. And we end up with this, I think that's what I did. Take the two things away to get rid of the F of minus one and then divide by five, and we get F of one equals three. Question 15 is very much the same, so I'll give you, I mean, you should should just, uh, you should have been trying every question, right? That's the whole point. But um, definitely try this now that you've seen 14 because it's very similar. We're being asked for f of nine. So we put nine in, um, two times nine plus three is 21 over seven is three. So that gives us f of three here, um, which means that why don't we just try shoving in f of three and hoping for the best. And when you do that, two times three plus three is nine over three minus two is one, that's nine. You get another nine back. Again, swap these two over to make it easy to see them and stack them up. And then maybe times this one by two and add them together is probably what I did. That's exactly what I did. Good. And uh, divide and you get your answer of 12. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to Jacqueline for writing another paper. Hopefully there's a few more to come if I can manage them. And do, uh, and do email her if you have any questions or want any help.